now visible in Columbus Palo camera, Palo Bay cameras, is the Strait of Hormuz uh, in the Persian Gulf. We have about a minute and a half before the orbiter moves out of range of our communication satellites. And uh, when we come back into range of those satellites in about eight or nine minutes, we expect to be waking the crew. Columbia, good morning. Hano, hano, Hawaii, la. Aloha, Houston. Aloha, Kako. That was a little Hawaiian music for you to get you ready for your call to the Hokalea in the South Pacific that's scheduled for later today. Sounds great. We'll be looking forward to that. This is Mission Control. This is from the flight deck of the orbiter Columbia as it passes over the Pacific Ocean, uh, slightly west of the Hawaiian Islands. In just a few, couple of minutes, we'll be uh, starting our contact, voice contact with the Hokalea sailing canoe. The Hokalea is a replica of an ancient Polynesian sailing canoe that is used to train young sailors in the ancestral navigation techniques used by early Polynesian voyagers to travel vast distances in the South Pacific unaided by navigation instruments. Hokalea sailors steer their craft by sighting on stars and reading the wind and wave currents. Comparisons have shown that the Hokalea makes its course across the ocean with the same degree of accuracy as contemporary vessels which use the latest electronic navigation aids. And the gentleman that you all see in the yellow shirt, his name is Lacey Veach, he's a local boy. He's from Hawaii. Right. Uh, big aloha note to you folks all from us here in Hawaii. Columbia, stand by for Hokulea. Uh, Hokulea, please call Columbia. Voice quality is readable. This is Commander Jim Weatherby of the Columbia, and I have with me the members of Columbia's crew, and, and also I have next to me Lacey Beach, Hawaii's own. Uh, good morning, and aloha to Commander Weatherby and the whole crew of Columbia. And I'd like to give a special aloha to Ashton and Ashton Beach. Aloha to you, aloha kako. Aloha kakoyaka. How is your uh, how is your sail from Rarotonga? We understand you left on Monday and that you're at sea for two days. Where do you estimate your position? Okay, stand by. At this time, we're going to put on the radio one of our two navigators on board. Keep a line and we'll give a position and also a weather report. Stand by.
You're very broken and barely readable. Uh, Columbia is presently, uh, we passed over Hawaii about seven minutes ago, and right now we are just coming up on uh, the southern United States and Central America.
travel and explore by canoe with tools such as this. And uh, what we're doing today here in space is literally just an extension of that human uh, spirit of adventure and exploration. And once again, we on the uh, ship Columbia salute the crew of the ship of Hokalea and wish you bon voyage. Hokalea, please respond to the uh, Columbia, over. Hello, Columbia. You folks take care. Have a safe landing. Lacey and Bill, we'll see you in Hawaii in December, over. Aloha from the crew of Columbia. Hokulea and Columbia. Aloha, uh, Hokulea. Uh, what do you think are the similarities and differences between the shuttle and the Hokulea mission? Well, the similarities are that uh, they are both uh, voyages of exploration. Hokulea is exploring the past. Columbia is beginning the exploration for the future. What experiments are you doing to help create new ideas for the space station?
Aloha kako, and welcome to the 19th annual Astronaut Lacey Beach Day of Discovery. On behalf of the Beach family and this year's sponsors, Hawaiian Electric and the Hawaii Space Grant Consortium, we thank you for your participation today. Not only are we virtual this year, but we are also international. Big mahalos and thank you to Art and Reen Kimura for having the vision and making this event a reality. My name is Dora, and I will be your MC for the next 90 minutes for our first jam-packed virtual beach day. Are you guys ready? Let's get started. Today, we are here to honor the legacy of astronaut Charles Lacey Beach. Lacey was a graduate of Punahou School in Hawaii and went on to the U.S. Air Force Academy, where he had a distinguished 14-year career as a colonel in the U.S. Air Force. He flew fighter jets like the F-100 Sabre, the F-111, the F-105 Thunder Chief, and later the T-38s and the F-16 Falcons. He flew over 200 missions in Vietnam and was also a member of the U.S. Air Force elite aerobatics team known as the Thunderbirds. In 1984, Lacey became an astronaut. He flew in two space shuttle missions, STS-39 in 1991 aboard the Space Shuttle Discovery and STS-52 in 1992 aboard the Space Shuttle Columbia. He logged an impressive 436.3 hours in space. We will hear more about Lacey from his friends and family later in the program, but you can also click below for more information about Lacey. Last year, we had over 600 students from around the islands attend the 18th annual Lacey Beach Day of Discovery, held for the first time on Kamehameha School's Kapalama campus here on the island of Oahu. Today, our virtual venue promises to be even bigger and faster paced with an international audience joining. You will be seeing a number of keynotes, workshops, and learning Q&As. So many organizations and dedicated volunteers made this happen behind the scenes. Okay, for your first challenge, I hope you're ready. Join us for the Galaxy Treasure Hunt. Check out the link below for the submission forms and instructions. Submit completed forms to be invited to live virtual field trips taking place in November and December. You won't want to miss out. We will be visiting some incredible people, visiting their exotic locations, labs, and checking out some amazing equipment. Here's a hint. Listen closely at the end of each workshop for the answers to the 10 Galaxy Treasure Hunt questions. We also want you to check out the Tumblr challenge. For this challenge, you will be submitting a video and be eligible for a prize. This challenge is also only open to grades K through eight and limited to the first 50 signups. Information on how to register and get a kit is provided on the slide and the link below. Welcome to the 2020 Astronaut Lacey Beach Day. I'm NASA astronaut Chris Cassidy, currently aboard the International Space Station and floating in the cupola. 
Astronaut Veach grew up in Honolulu and had an early interest in science and space. He went on to become an astronaut and had a very distinguished career at NASA. While at NASA, he flew two shuttle missions and helped develop and design plans for the cupola, this very module I'm enjoying. This multi-windowed module not only provides an amazing observation area for crew members to view our beautiful planet Earth, as well as other celestial objects, but it also gives us visibility to support and control the space station's robotic arm, which we use to move objects around the outside of the ISS. Past astronauts, such as Lacey Veach, have paved the way for our future exploration to the moon, to Mars, and beyond. Hello from Florida. I am Miley Chatlos, daughter of Lacey Beach, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 19th annual Astronaut Lacey Beach Day of Discovery. My father would truly be humbled at the idea that there's a whole day dedicated to his legacy, but he would also be so excited that there's a whole day dedicated to science and STEM. He absolutely loves science and he loves space and exploration. When my brother and I were little, his favorite thing to do would be wake us up in the middle of the night and take us in the backyard and set up the telescope so we could look at stars and planets. And the whole time he would talk about how exciting space is and talk about exploring the universe and colonizing planets. That was his dream. And who knows, maybe one of you students today will be the one to fulfill that dream. We are very excited to be a part of this this year. Um, this will be the first year that Lacey's grandchildren, my three boys, will be able to participate in this event. And of course, none of this would be possible without the volunteers who have worked so hard, who have organized and provided the Galaxy Treasure Hunt, the workshops, the keynotes, the ads, um, hardware science for providing the STEM kits, and of course, Hawaiian Electric, the founding and continuing sponsor of the Lacey Beach Day of Discovery. From the Veach and Chatlos families, thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We are truly grateful for all that you do. And to the students, have a great day exploring science. Hawaiian Electric has been a sustaining sponsor of the Astronaut Lacey Beach Day of Discovery. They've supported this event through grants, employee volunteers, and engaging workshops. We are honored today to have Scott Sue, CEO and President of Hawaiian Electric, to share a few words. Welcome, Scott. Aloha, I'm Scott Sue, President and CEO of Hawaiian Electric, Hawaii's largest electric company serving the islands of Oahu, Hawaii Island, Maui, Molokai, and Lanai. We are so proud to be a founding sponsor of the Lacey Beach Day of Discovery and to welcome you to the 2020 event, its 19th year. We hope you enjoyed today's virtual event. One of the outcomes of this new format is an expanded group of presenters and audiences from around the world, and it's a pleasure to welcome all of you. A big mahalo to everyone involved in making today's event happen. As many of you know, Lacey Veach flew for the United States Air Force as a pilot and later for NASA as an astronaut on two memorable space missions. His legacy of exploration, discovery, and innovation is what this event was founded upon. He fondly called Hawaii his home and made us all proud by pushing boundaries and living his dream. I never had the honor of meeting Lacey Veach, but I sure would have liked to. My dream when I was a kid was to be a fighter pilot or an astronaut or someone who could work with wonderful pieces of machinery that take people to places they've never been before. I never learned to fly. I became a mechanical engineer instead. Today in my role at Hawaiian Electric, I suppose I am working with a wonderful piece of machinery called an electric company that's taking our energy system in Hawaii to a place it's never been before. One that will be 100% non-fossil fueled and decarbonized and uses smart technologies to power our communities, our homes, our businesses, our cars, and yes, our robots. We employ more than 2,600 people across our islands 
many in positions that require backgrounds in STEM. We have engineers, environmental scientists, equipment technicians and operators, accountants, practically any STEM-related job you can think of, except being a pilot or astronaut. We use STEM knowledge to analyze and troubleshoot and design and create, and of course, to communicate with each other and with our community. Of course, our communities, both worldwide and local, have been hit hard this year by the COVID-19 pandemic. So many of you have had to deal with real impacts of illness and losing jobs and postponing important life events. If the pandemic has taught us anything, it's that we need critical thinkers and problem solvers who come from a place of compassion to push for answers and inventive solutions to the pressing challenges that face us today and that will face us in the future. But for today, I hope you're inspired by what you see and learn and that tomorrow and in the future, you will discover success in pursuit of your dreams. To all the participants, presenters, exhibitors, volunteers, organizations, sponsors, and staff who make this event possible, a very warm mahalo for your dedication and commitment that ensures Lacey Veach's legacy continues. Mahalo Scott and Hawaiian Electric. Next, we will be joined by Nainoa Thompson, Poe Navigator and President of the Polynesian Voyaging Society. Nainoa was born and raised in Honolulu, Hawaii. He is a graduate of Punahou School and went on to the University of Hawaii at Manoa. In 1980, he became the first Hawaiian in over 600 years to navigate a voyaging canoe from Hawaii to Tahiti using only celestial navigation meaning no Google Maps or modern instruments, just a star compass. As explorers and wayfinders, Lacey and Nainoa became colleagues and close friends. Inspired by Lacey over 20 years earlier, the seeds for Hukulea's voyage of exploration was planted. And on May 18, 2014, the Hukulea and her sister vessel, the Hikianalia, embarked on a historic three-year journey around the world to Malama Honua, care for the planet, and returned to Oahu on June 17, 2017. At this time, please welcome Nainoa Thompson. Aloha mai kako. My name is Nainoa Thompson. I'm one of the voyagers on the voyaging canoe Hokulea and um, I'm really, really um, honored to be here today uh, to celebrate a dear friend of mine. And, um, and I'm grateful that all of you that are on this Zoom thing, wherever you are, um, thank you for taking the time to be here. Um, it's important to me. And it's um, basically because it's been such a privilege to have known Lacey Beach. Um, I, I define him as best friend, and um, but more importantly, I think what's fitting for d today is to know that he was one of my greatest teachers, and uh, and had a huge impact on my life. And it's safe to say that he's navigated and set the course for Hokulea in the last 15 years. And that's because he's an explorer. And, and that's because he's an astronaut. Um, and, you know, many, many people see him clearly as um, Keiki Oka Aina, Ku Aina, he's from this land uh, that he calls Hawaii, he loved it deeply. His uh, growing up here really set the course for his values, for everything that he would do as an explorer. And, uh, and he loved this place. And he, people see him as a fighter pilot uh, in the Air Force uh, in Vietnam. Also see him as one of the very elite pilots that flew for the Thunderbirds, the elite pilot team. And, uh, and then, of course, we mostly see him as, as um, an astronaut, second astronaut from Hawaii after Allison Onizuka. But again, I see him as best friend and teacher and uh it it's impossible to 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 share all of the influence that he had on me but he you know we would go up to um we did a lot of pretty 
awesome things together. Um, but the ones that I remember the most was times with him, um, quiet times uh, in special places. We would make these uh, trips to go up to the 6,000 foot elevation in the cradle of the big powerful mountains on the island of Hawaii, Mauna Kea, Mauna Loa, and Hualalai. And we would go on the black lava and we would uh, we would watch the stars and on the black lava it absorbed all light, bring stars close. And it was a time where Lacey said, now's the time to explore our imagination. And let's let's figure out how we can help young people understand the power of and the importance of exploration. And how do we do that by bringing the the shuttle program and the voyage of Hokulea together to ground uh, our young people in looking to our past at, at the great achievements of our ancestors, but look forward to the power of technology and, and that importance of exploring to find solutions for the things on earth. And it was there in these times when he would start to talk about the island, um, the only one we have the only one that eight billion of us share. He would talk about, you have no idea how beautiful the island Earth is until you see the whole thing from space, Nainoa. But he says, but he would start to caution that, and it was like a premonition way back when, um, uh, before even climate change was a really powerful word, he would say, we're changing the Earth. It's going to change us, and we don't know what to do. Then he would start planting the seeds of you can't protect what you don't understand and, and you won't if you don't care and you can't do it by yourself. Nainoa, take Hokulea around the world. Uh, he planted that seed of conversation in the mountains in 1992 and then we'd lose him in 1995. And then it'll be 14 years where we would dream of going but never going because it was too dangerous and then um, he would remind us uh, he's a teacher forever and he would remind us that um, you know what's more dangerous than I know is it is it the hurricane or the pirate or violence or the mosquito or is it to not go and not go and protect what you love so we voted in the 2008, 14 years after he passed away, and we decided to go sail Hokulea around the world because of him. And, and, and so his influence is, he says, he would say, you, again, you can't protect what you don't understand. You need to understand the earth. And when we look at the earth today, so many times when you listen to what people are saying, it's, it's, as, if, it's as if the world is falling apart that all the things that we see, whether it's disease or climate or so forth, it's, it's uh, changing us and everything is out of control. Lacey would never say that. He would say, he would say, it's now the time to find the seeds of hope, to look towards what we can resolve, look, look to the best of who we are, who we were and who we can become. And what he would say is, what the world needs now more than ever in human history is explorers. The individuals that will, that will go and find the solutions to the world's greatest challenges. Those that would have the courage amongst all the fear that we live in to find the way. It would be explorers and navigators, navigators for the earth. And what he would say to you in this Zoom, um, he would say, thank you, because he was a very humble man. And he would, he would say, thank you, thank you for giving up a little bit of your time to be with him today. Because he would say, especially to the children of Hawaii, that you're born to this land. You have families that are caring because they understand the culture of this place. It's a place full of love. And, it's, and he would talk about this place as being all the things that the world needs we can achieve here. And that he would say that Hawaii could be, um, it could be the school 
for the planet if we learn how to explore ways in which we can live here to know how to live well on islands and share it to the world. And he would say to all the young people there that it's your time, take your grounding of this place, the values of all of your family, take your imagination and take your education and, uh, and go and explore and believe and become the seed of hope. And that's why um, I'm so privileged to, uh, to maybe say a few words on his behalf, because he can't be here today. To, um, not to honor him, but because he doesn't need that. What he needs is you to become the seed of hope. Take all that you have, believe in it, explore, change the world, make it a better place. That's what Lacey would say. Thank you. Aloha, my name is Punavai Rice and I am the school programs coordinator at the Imiloa Astronomy Center of Hawaii in Hilo on Hawaii Island. Imiloa is a public science and Hawaiian culture museum located on the University of Hawaii at Hilo campus. We have a native Hawaiian garden, exhibit hall, and planetarium theater. Let's delve into the formation of our solar system. Scientists believe that during the forming of the earth and moon, its melted material began to cool and separate. The high density materials sank to the center and the low density materials rose to the top. This process is called differentiation, which gives earth its distinctive layers, each with its own properties. Let's explore density and do an experiment to observe how different materials separate from each other, forming layers based on their density values. We will need the following household kitchen items. One third cup of dish soap, one third cup corn syrup. I chose strawberry syrup, but you can also use pancake syrup. One third cup oil, vegetable oil or any cooking oil will do, and one third cup water. Please use tap water and save the bottled water for your home emergency preparedness kit. Finally, you will need a clear tall container and three spoons. I chose a tall drinking glass, but an empty spaghetti sauce jar will work. You may have to increase the amount of each liquid depending on the volume of your container. What these four liquids have in common is they all share the same volume amount of space they occupy, one third cup. What is different about each liquid is the density, amount of stuff, ingredients, molecules packed into that one third cup. To calculate density of a substance, you divide the mass by the volume. Take our one third cup of water, for example. The mass is found by weighing it, which I found to be 79 grams. We divide that by the volume, which when we convert one third cup to milliliters, it is 79 milliliters. The density of water then is one gram per milliliter. Its density value is one. Without giving you the density values of the other three liquids, let's see if we can figure out which is more dense and which is less dense by combining them in the glass container. We're going to start with the oil and the corn syrup. Which one do you think is more dense? Which one do you think is less dense? And what will happen when we combine them in the container? Let's add the oil to the glass. Pour your one third cup of oil into your glass container, your clear container. And then grab your first spoon Put it into the container, not in the liquid, but right above it, and pour your one third cup of corn syrup on top of the spoon. The idea is not to create a large splash. And we can see which one is more dense. It's the one that is sinking to the bottom, and that would be the corn syrup. Grab a, your second spoon and pour the dish soap onto your spoon. And let's see where the dish soap is in this combination. Oh, we can see it sinking down below the oil. So the dish soap is 
less dense than the corn syrup, but more dense than the oil. Grab your third spoon and pour the water onto that spoon. No splash, please. Now again, water has a density value of one gram per milliliter, one. So what do you think is the density value of the oil? The oil is floating on top of the water. It is less dense than the water. So its density value is less than one and the soap and the syrup is greater than one. What if we add solids to our liquids? Do solids behave differently their densities than liquid? I chose some um, solids from my kitchen, apple, macadamia nut, a string cheese and a carrot. I chopped them up just so they will all fit in the glass at the same time. And let's combine them with our liquids, starting with the apple. Ooh, which one is more dense, the apple or the macadamia nut? You can grab any um, items from your kitchen. Make sure they fit in the glass. Oh, didn't see that one coming. The apple is less dense than the oil. And when we add the macadamia nuts, where do you think it's going to go? Oh, it's floating on top of the water. So it is less dense than water. Their density values are less than one, the macadamia nut and the apple. What about the string cheese and carrot? Which one is more dense? I'm going to drop in the string cheese. Oh, we can see them it's sinking down below the oil, the water, and the dish soap. But it's less dense than the syrup. And what about the carrot? And the carrot is sinking down below the oil and the water. With just a few kitchen items, you too can explore one of the many processes involved in the formation of our solar system. Mahalo and aloha from the Imilo Astronomy Center of Hawaii. Aloha, I am Emily Peavy. I'm an astronomy educator and planetarium technician at Niloa Astronomy Center. I'm a graduate of the University of Hawaii at Hilo, and I was inspired to study astronomy by the stunning night sky on Mauna Kea. Astronomers on Mauna Kea and around the world have linked together radio observatories in a way that had never been done before in order to do something truly revolutionary, capture an image of a black hole. Last year, we were introduced to Povehi, the first ever image of a supermassive black hole. Povehi lives in the center of a galaxy called M87. Do you think that Povehi's physical size is as big as the sun, as big as the Earth's orbit around the sun, as big as Neptune's orbit around the sun, or four times the size of Neptune's orbit? The answer is four times the size of Neptune's orbit. That is big. Hovehi is one of the largest black holes that we know of, but it's a pretty quiet black hole. It doesn't have a lot of material orbiting around it. And now that we know we can capture an image of such a big black hole, we can work on capturing images of smaller and more active black holes like the black hole in the center of our galaxy, which has entire star systems orbiting around it. When electricity first lit up our neighborhoods, Hawaiian Electric was there. In the face of difficult challenges, or when problems hit close to home, we are there and leading the way to a 100% clean energy future. Hawaiian Electric will be there. Hi everyone. Thanks for joining us in this year's 19th annual Lacey Beach Day, with this class being hosted by Hawaiian Electric. Now historically, Hawaiian Electric was made up of three companies. Hawaiian Electric here on Oahu, Maui Electric, which covers Molokai Lanai, and Hawaii Electric Light on the Big Island. We recently changed that and now we are one company. We provide electricity to up to 95% of the state's 1.4 million residents. In year 2016, we hit our 125th anniversary. 
Let's talk a bit about batteries. Batteries convert chemical energy into electrical energy. Through chemical reactions uh, between different substances and an electrolyte, electricity is transferred from the anode to the cathode where the electrons are collected. Now this in principle is the concept of oxidation and reduction. And we're gonna make a battery that uses this uh, by creating reactions between the aluminum and the activated charcoal where the electrons are collected. So what you'll need to make the aluminum air battery is a cup for making the salt solution, an empty cup with cover, which will be your battery cell, a strip of aluminum foil, a bag of charcoal, salt, nylon tie pouch, two conductors, two rubber bands, paper towels, a glue dot, a motor, and a star to finish it off. All right, everyone, why don't we get started in building our charcoal battery? All right, we can start by filling one of the cups provided with about a third of its volume with water. And as you can see here, I've already filled it uh, with the salt and stir until it dissolves and to the point where the salt appears diluted. And we're going to set this aside for later use. Now, we're going to take the activated charcoal and pour into the pouch or a sheet of paper to the fine charcoal dust. And we're going to tie the pouch. And then at this point, insert the red wire into the pouch. Make sure the charcoal covers the end of the wire. Okay, exposing the conductor and create a nice little tight seal here. Okay. We're gonna take the rubber band and wrap it around the base a few times. to hold that in place. Now we take the black wire, known as our DC negative, and we're gonna wrap the foil around one end of the wire, prefer this end. It's got more of the conductor exposed here. Wrap it really tight and go about one and a half inches in Get it snug around the base there. And we'll leave that for later use. Now we're gonna soak. Fold the paper into that salt water solution that's been sitting around for a while. Okay, get it really nice and soaked there. Okay, and you can squeeze out some of that water. And then you're gonna wrap it around the base of the charcoal pouch, kind of like this. Okay. Now take aluminum foil and the wire combination that you created earlier and wrap that around the pouch and making sure everything is snug and tight there. Let's twist these ends here. Okay. Like so. So now what you've created here is a battery cell. You're gonna place the battery cell into the cup, right? And pour some of the salt water solution into the cup. And from there, you place the lid over the cup and make sure that the wires stick out. See these nice little holes we pre made. There's your battery cell. Now take your glue dot and you're gonna place that directly over the lid. You're gonna remove the paper backing on the star so the adhesive side is shown and place that directly over the shaft of the motor, just like so. 
and it's the star is simply an easy way for you to see that the motor is rotating yeah nice visual indicator okay and you're gonna place that directly over your cup there and what I'll then begin to do is make sure because this is DC connect the positive red wire to the positive red wire that's sticking out okay. and for now we'll just wrap it around like this and then take the black wire again known as DC negative and wrap it around like this Just like so. Our own charcoal activated DC powered battery. The challenge is to see how long this will actually run. See what other things you can do or create or power with this DC battery. All right, take care. Hope you join us again next year for Lacey Beach Day. This is Marvin with Hawaiian Electric, signing off. Hi, I'm Ben. I'm a flight controller for the International Space Station, working out of the Admission Control Center here at NASA's Johnson Space Center. I'm a graduate of the Hawaii Preparatory Academy in Waimea, and I got my bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering from Embry-Riddle in Arizona. I first got inspired to pursue a career in space due to my dad's work at the Keck Observatory on Mauna Kea. Do you know how many years the astronauts have been living and working aboard the International Space Station? Is it 1, 5, 10, or 20 years? The answer is 20 years. For the past 20 years, as of this November, NASA and our 17 partner nations have been operating and keeping astronauts alive and working in the space station permanently. Looking forward to many more years of operations ahead. Aloha, we are from the Hawaii Space Flight Laboratory, a research organization at the University of Hawaii at Manoa that focuses on aerospace and small satellites. Established in 2007 within the School of Ocean and Earth Science and Technology, as well as the College of Engineering, HSFL is a multidisciplinary research and education center which brings together individuals from diverse areas to work on exploration and understanding of the space environment. HSFL aims to promote innovative engineering and science research for terrestrial and planetary space missions. They also develop, test, launch, and operate small spacecrafts and provide workforce training in Hawaii. Their current satellite project called Neutron One is a spacecraft that detects radiation around the moon. It is roughly the size of a loaf of bread and is scheduled to launch from the ISS later this year. HSFL interacts with, on average, about 100 students per year through various research and internship programs. This enables Hawaii students to gain experience in the aerospace field as well as learn the tools necessary to get jobs. Currently, the team is supporting two vertically integrated student projects, Team Hokulele, UH Manoa's high-powered rocket team, and the Ka'o Satellite Development Team, who are striving to design and build an affordable 1U CubeSat. Today, we will be exploring the science behind helicopters by making our own rotocopters with materials you have at home. At HSFL, many of our spacecraft instruments can be tested using an unmanned aerial vehicle or a drone. Several of our engineers are also licensed UAV operators. Also, NASA has sent a helicopter to Mars. Ingenuity weighs 4 pounds, is solar powered, and was launched on July 30th, 2020, and will land on February 18th, 2021 with the Perseverance rover. Before we start our activity, we are going to learn the four forces that help helicopters fly. Once a helicopter is off the ground, four aerodynamic forces act on it. Weight, thrust, drag, and lift. Weight is the combined load of the helicopter, which includes the weight of the helicopter itself, its crew, and the cargo. This force pulls the helicopter downward as a result of gravity. Thrust is the force produced by the rotation of the helicopter's blades. Its direction can be forward, rearward, sideward, or vertical. Drag is the force that opposes the movement of the helicopter through the air. Finally, lift is the upward force acting on a helicopter that pushes it up and keeps it in flight. For any object to fly in the air, it must have the force of lift pushing it upwards. But for that to happen, the air must pass around an airfoil. An airfoil is any surface that produces more lift than drag when passing through the air at a given angle. Now that you have learned about lift, we are ready to start our activity. 
Print out the template using the URL above. You will need the following supplies. Your paper template, recycled cardstock, scratch paper or binder paper, scissors, paper clips, and stickers, colored pencils or pens for decoration. Step 1. Cut along the solid lines of the template. Step 2. Fold along the dotted lines. Fold the X and Y flaps towards the center and fold Z up to give the body of your rotorcopter rigidity and lower the center of gravity. Don't forget, the propeller blades should be folded in opposite directions in order for this to work. Step 3. Stand up and drop the rotorcopter. What do you observe? Now, crumble up a piece of paper and drop an unfolded piece of paper at the same time. Which one will fall faster? The crumbled ball will fall faster because the sheet of paper has more surface area which offers more resistance to the air than the paper ball. Try testing this air resistance experiment by using different paperweights such as cardstock or binder paper and see how your rotorcopter reacts differently. Okay, now this is the fun part. Try using different colored paper, decorating your paper rotorcopter, or even adding paper clips or other light weights to it and see how this affects the flight. You can even change the angle of incidence or how angled the rotorcopter blades are. The options are endless. In this video, we are cutting off Z to further lower the center of gravity. Mahalo for participating, and we hope you had lots of fun! Up next, we will be hearing from a number of Lacey's colleagues, fellow astronauts, and Lacey's sister, Diana Beach. It's with great pleasure that I introduce astronaut Bill Shepard. Bill received his degree in aerospace engineering from the U.S. Naval Academy and served in the elite Navy SEAL. He became an astronaut in 1984 and flew on three space shuttle missions and commanded the first crew for the International Space Station. Astronaut Shepard flew with Lacey on STS-52 in 1992 and has logged 139 days in space. Now that's like 3,000 hours in space. Welcome Astronaut Shepard. I'm honored uh, to be with you today as a guest speaker on Astronaut Lacey of Each Day. Lacey's flying with NASA was all done two decades ago. Um, I'm hoping that many of the people who are tuning in are, are younger folks, students in school. So I thought uh, since Lacey and I started our work uh, in the astronaut program at the same time, I'd give you some background on some of the things that Lacey did and uh, a few of those I was involved in. I've got a, a number of pictures here. The first one is taken in July of 1984. It's the uh, astronaut group 10 in front of one of our training aircraft. Um, this is 17 astronauts, Lacey and myself in that picture. And this was one of the official NASA group photos. Uh, the next shot is one that we did that was somewhat more informal. Uh, it's a group of us on a Stearman biplane. We really like that photograph. Uh, the next photo is the same photograph uh, treated a little more classically. It's uh, We like to think of it as a classic photo of a classic biplane with a classic group of astronauts. Lacey's real passion was flying. Uh, this is a picture of two NASA T-38s. Before Lacey was selected to be an astronaut. He served at NASA as an instructor pilot. And before that, he was he had a long career in the Air Force, uh, went to Vietnam, flew fighters, and uh, got picked up at NASA to 
help uh, train astronauts in the T-38 jets and he did that before he got selected in 1984. His first flight uh, happened in 1991 aboard Discovery. This is a picture of the seven person crew uh, for that mission, STS-39, arriving at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, the next photo is a night launch of Discovery taking off from Kennedy Space Center going to space. Uh, this, the subsequent shot is a shot on the flight deck looking kind of at the rear at one of the payload control panels and Lacey is managing some of the sensors and equipment that were flown on that that mission. I had uh, worked and trained with Lacey for many years and in uh, 1990, late 1990, Lacey and I were selected to be part of uh, shuttle mission STS-52 and here's a crew shot of uh, all six of us in our uh, flight suits, our pressure suits. And uh, the next shot is uh, the crew standing on the launch pad down at Kennedy Space Center with the fully assembled uh, STS shuttle transportation system, booster, fuel tank, and orbiter in the background. Uh, quite, quite a big vehicle. Lacey and I were photographed here standing on the top of the launch platform and we're in our pressure suits and we're practicing emergency egress. And this is something we might have to do in an emergency to get away from the pad in case there's danger and the, the shuttle can't fly, but the crew's got to get out of there. Um, fortunately, our, our launch in October of 1992 was, was successful. We spent 10 days in space. The last picture is really one of my favorites. Uh, you can see the big island of Hawaii in the background. We're 200 miles up in space over the Pacific Ocean. And Lacey brought along uh, a relic from prehistoric uh, Hawaii. It's, a, it's an adze that was found up, on the, up in the volcano on the big island. And this was used uh, basically by woodworkers that were making uh, boats and, and structures out of... Uh, the, the materials at hand, and these were all, these were really, really early stone tools, and that actually flew in space. So, I just want to, uh, just want to share with everybody that working with Lacey was a tremendous privilege. I was always impressed with his very strong connections to Hawaii, but also to exploration and education. Uh, just in closing, Lacey's left us a legacy. We remember his professional skill, his passion for flying in space, his, uh, his humor, his skill as an airman, his camaraderie, and uh, he's just an exceptional human. Hi, I'm Larry Wiss. I volunteer as a space science educator with the NASA JPL Solar System Ambassadors Program. The mission of Solar System Ambassadors is to share the latest science and discoveries of NASA's space exploration missions through a variety of inspirational events. There are over a thousand Solar System Ambassador volunteer presenters in 50 states and Washington, D.C., Puerto Rico, Guam, and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Since it began in 1999, Solar System Ambassador volunteers have participated in over 50,000 events, reaching 10 million people. Visit the Solar System Ambassadors website to locate your local volunteer. Today, I'm going to show you how to make a Cartesian diver using easily available materials and use it to conduct a science experiment to show the relationship between pressure and volume. This experiment is named after Rene Descartes, a French scientist and mathematician who used the diver to demonstrate gas laws and buoyancy. The materials you'll need are a one liter clear plastic bottle with label removed, filled with water, and with its screw-on cap. Larger size bottles are not recommended. A glass eyedropper and a clear pitcher filled with water. Step 1. Fill the glass eyedropper about one-fourth full with water. You may need to experiment with the amount of water in the eyedropper. Make it so that the eyedropper is barely floating in the pitcher of water. Step two, place the eyedropper into the clear plastic bottle. The eyedropper should float and the water in the bottle should be overflowing. Seal the bottle securely with its cap.
step three. Gently squeeze the sides of the bottle and notice how the eyedropper, called a diver, sinks. Release your squeeze and it floats back up to the top. Step four, squeeze the bottle again and observe the water level in the eyedropper. It goes up. So how does it work? Squeezing the bottle causes the diver, the eyedropper, to sink because the increased pressure inside the bottle forces water up into the diver, compressing the air at the top of the eyedropper. This increases the density of the diver, causing it to sink. Releasing the squeeze decreases the pressure on the air at the top of the eyedropper, and the water is forced back out of the diver, lowering its density and allowing it to float back to the top of the bottle. Practice making the diver go up and down without it looking like you're squeezing the bottle. Now you're ready to amaze your friends with your ability to make the diver obey your commands. Have fun! Welcome students and teachers to learning about NASA and the space program. I am NASA astronaut Joe Acaba. I've had the privilege of flying in space on three missions, on Space Shuttle Discovery in 2009, and on the Russian Soyuz spacecraft for expeditions to the International Space Station in 2012 and 2018, spending a total of 306 days in space. It was always a dream of mine to become an astronaut and travel to space, starting with viewing the Apollo missions to the moon and the reading of a lot of science fiction books. Living and working in space is amazing, and the science we are conducting is truly changing our lives and preparing us for future space missions. I hope you continue to follow your dreams, whatever they may be, and if they involve space, we hope you will become part of the NASA team and the space program as we plan to return to the moon to stay and then to eventually send humans to Mars. Have a wonderful school year and stay safe. I look forward to seeing the incredible discoveries that you make. Hi, my name is Dr. Frankie Zhu, and I am an assistant professor at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. I study aerospace engineering, and specifically how robots think and how they learn to move in an unknown environment. I got my PhD in Dynamics and Controls and Systems Engineering. Did you know that there have been 12 people who have been to the surface of the moon? But can you guess how many of them have been women? None yet, but NASA created a program called the Artemis program that will send the first woman to the moon. I hope that one day you'll apply to be an astronaut. Uh, see you there. Hi, my name is Jonah Larica, and I am the VP of Communications for the Engineers Council at the University of Hawaii, or ECUH. And ECUH is a student, organi uh, or student organization uh, that uh, goal is to promote unity between both faculty and students. Uh, we want to promote learning, uh, we want to promote this College of Engineering, as well as the engineering education here at the University of Hawaii. And today we have a short demonstration to you, uh, and hopefully that it will intrigue you on of joining engineering. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jordan Mehta and I'll be the VP of Internal Affairs for this coming fall semester. And this is Kylie Urasaki, the president of ECUH. Uh, sure. today, today we're going to be showing you an experiment in the center of mass of objects. So this is a physics concept, but physics is heavily involved in all of the engineering, physical engineering fields. Okay, so finding the center of mass of an object is pretty simple. For a 2D uh, narrow object, it's always just along the base, or along the flat side, towards the middle. I don't know how to explain that in more technical form. And when you have both sides equally balancing, you know you found the center of mass. It gets a little more complicated when it's no longer a flat surface, so if you have two objects interlock like this. This would obviously be the center of mass if it were facing down, but if, to have it this way, you need to have the center of mass outside of the objects themselves. 
So in order to actually balance it, at a location over here. Or I'll show it on the folder paper, sorry. Okay. Uh, sorry, it's gonna be over here. So the center of mass for these two would actually be located outside of the body itself. And it would be right over here. And to demonstrate that this is true, we can use a toothpick and place it in between the prongs of the fork. and it balances like that. Have another toothpick, balancing right at that point. So this can balance on almost any surface, including the edge of a water glass. At least it was earlier. It's just a little finicky. Mm -hmm. Okay, and it's almost like it's levitating. Aloha! My name is Kumiko Usta Sato. I am an outreach astronomer from National Astronomical Observatory of Japan. NAOJ in Tokyo, Japan. Did you know we live in a galaxy? Yes. What is the name of the galaxy we live? It is Milky Way Galaxy. This is a model of our own galaxy, Milky Way. This is a galactic center and we live over here. Aloha, everyone. I'm Coyote. Who? Coyote, a science teacher at Farrington High School. Glad you could join us. I'm part of the Hawaii Science Teachers Association. What? The Hawaii Science Teachers Association. Sometimes we just say hasta. Hasta! Yes. Our organization helps science educators and organizations around the state collaborate with each other. We help by spreading information, providing professional development opportunities, and gathering like-minded people and organizations. We put together two activities for you today. Two? Yes, two. How lucky are we? We'll be making bouncy balls with Mrs. Gardner and elephant toothpaste with Mrs. Chan. Hello, this is Mrs. Gardner. Today we're gonna make some bouncy balls with borax and Elmer's glue. So here we go. So to make your own bouncy balls, you're gonna need Elmer's glue, borax, warm water, and food coloring. So we're gonna use about half a cup of warm water, which is about 120 milliliters, one tablespoon of borax. So let's go ahead and mix those two things together. Put one tablespoon of borax into the warm water and stir until it's dissolved. All right, next we're gonna add some glue. I poured my tablespoon a little too full. We're gonna add about two tablespoons of glue. And since I want a little color, I'm gonna mix some food coloring in first. So two tablespoons of glue and two drops of food coloring. There's my second spoonful. I'm going to add a cup of drops of food coloring and then I'm going to stir that. Alright, so there's my glue and blue food coloring. It's about two tablespoons worth and now I'm going to pour it into the borax solution. Here it goes. And we're going to give that a couple of moments to react. Next, use your hand to stir Move the ball around a little bit so you can feel it's starting to get stickier from the borax solution and the glue making a polymer. All right, after you've left it in the borax solution for a few seconds, you're gonna take it out and you're gonna start to move it with your hands. Your 
hands are gonna get a little messy, but after a while you're gonna see that it's gonna start to come off very easily. And my ball is starting to take shape. All right, it took me about five minutes of playing with it, but you can see my hands are much better. Um, so this is essentially really firm slime, so it will change shape if you leave it. But if you roll it up and bounce it, it bounces quite nicely. So yeah, enjoy making your own bouncy ball with borax, Elmer's glue, and warm water. Aloha. Thanks, Mrs. Gardener. I can't wait to make my own bouncy ball at home. Bouncy, bouncy, bouncy. This activity really shows us some important science standards like planning and carrying out an investigation. What's that? Like your own project. Oh. It even has you considering the proportions and quantities of ingredients that you will use. It also shows us how matter reacts with each other in chemical reactions. Maybe you can experiment on your own and see how you can make the bounciest bouncy ball possible. Okay, now let's hear from Mrs. Chan about creating elephant toothpaste. I'm Mrs. Chan and today we're doing a short experiment. Inside this graduated cylinder, I have hydrogen peroxide and food coloring. Here I have a glass thermometer and I just wanna see what my room temperature of these two things are. And on my thermometer, there's a red line going up and it's 28 degrees, okay? So now I'm gonna put on my goggles and I'm gonna add two things into this graduated cylinder. First, this Ajax soap. So we'll add this here. You can see the soap mixing in with the food coloring and the hydrogen peroxide. Now I'm going to add some yeast. Wow. This is what they call elephant toothpaste. I wonder what the temperature is. Just gonna give it a second to register. Now the temperature is 35 degrees Celsius. Thank you for watching our video on elephant toothpaste. Wow. Thanks, Mrs. Chan. I have so many questions. So many questions. What questions can you come up with? Both of these videos show us chemical reactions. What happens when different things react? Hmm. See if you can construct some explanations after you plan and carry out your own investigation at home. Okay, for more information about these lessons, visit our website, hasta.wildapricot.org. What about social media? You can also find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Science Hawaii. Thanks, everyone. graduate of Waikea High School. I decided to become an engineer after attending science camps just like you are doing today. I love learning how things work. I currently work at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory as an electrical integration and test engineer. We are currently building a new Earth observer called NISAR. Do you know how many NASA Earth science satellites are currently operational? Is it 5, 28, 40, or 100? NASA currently has 28 active Earth science missions. Observing Earth from space helps us to understand our planet's interconnected systems. I hope one day you will join NASA in increasing our knowledge of Earth and space. Hello, my name is Andrea and I'm an engineer at Oceanit. And today I'm going to be doing some electrolysis, which is a fancy word for splitting water. So in a water molecule, you have H2O and what this process does is it takes H2O and makes it H2 and O2. So for every one oxygen, you get two hydrogen. And we'll see what that looks like on our electrodes. So right now in front of me, I have some water and I have some salt. And I'm going to mix the salt and the water 
because it increases the conductivity. So next I'm going to connect the electrodes. These are just two pipes and you can use metal or graphite, anything conductive. Fun fact, copper is one of the most conductive metals. On them I have written plus and minus, which is going to coordinate with this battery that I have. It's a nine volt battery with a plus and minus port. And that is what I'm going to connect using some wire. So red is positive and black is negative. This is a nine volt battery but the voltage it takes to split water is actually 1.23 volts. So I'm going to take one of my electrodes and hook up the wire for the negative. I'm going to put it in the water. And just to be safe, I'm going to tape it back so that the two electrodes don't hit when they're in the water. Next, I am going to take the positive electrode and hook that up to my positive wire and put it on the other side of this container. So that's that. We got all that set up. So now, completing the circuit uses this battery. We've got our positive and our negative. On the cathode, which is the name for the negative terminal or electrode, which is the black one, you're getting hydrogen. And on the anode, which is the positive terminal or electrode, you're getting oxygen. So since there's two hydrogen and one oxygen per molecule of water, you're going to get twice as much hydrogen as you are oxygen which is why the hydrogen evolution, as we call it, is twice as fast. And you can see it a lot more. So what happened was we have a positive and negative terminal and electrochemistry has a lot to do with charges and how chemicals react to those charges. In this case, our chemical is water. So oxygen likes going to the positive terminal because the negative charges are attracted to positive and repelled by the negative. Whereas hydrogen is going to the negative terminal because hydrogen is positive and it's repelled by the positive. Which is why when it was forming the bubbles, you always have only hydrogen on one side and only oxygen on the other which makes it a great separation technique. Buongiorno everyone. My name is Sarah Leone and I'm an engineer at Oceanit. And I have a trivia question for you guys. So right now I'm standing in beautiful Italy, which is the birthplace of what famous astronomer? I'll give you a hint. He is known as the father of modern science and invented the modern day telescope. Do you think you know? Well, if you answered Galileo, then you are right. Thank you for joining us. Arrivederci. Hi, I'm Trini. And I'm Shannon. We are part of Cognition Learning Center, or COGS, located at Kauai Community College. Here at COGS, our main goal is fun and exciting activities that explore the STEM fields. Today we are going to focus on a unique use of technology and some simple concepts regarding light painting. So what is light painting? Simply put, light painting is exactly as it sounds, painting with light. When you take a photo, the shutter in your camera opens for a set amount of time. While the shutter is open, light enters the camera and reaches the sensor. For most day-to-day -day photography, the time the shutter remains open is usually under one second. To achieve the imaging technique of light painting, we must prolong the amount of time the shutter stays open. By doing this, we can take a long exposure photo, allowing us to make a light painting. While the camera is important, one of the most important things when starting off with light painting is our environment we are going to be taking our picture in. Light painting works best in an environment with as little light as possible and once your area is set up you will need a camera a tripod or a place to set your camera and a source of light such as a glow stick or flashlight if you don't have a camera we will also go over how you can achieve this by using a phone or a tablet in 
and then grab your camera. All right. Once you turn your camera on, make sure that the settings is on manual. You don't want to have your camera on automatic settings. The setting that you want is shutter speed. So for this camera, all I'm going to do is scroll through this here and it automatically shows me my shutter speed. I'm going to take this one up to 15 seconds. If you're using a smartphone, there is a free app in the Apple Store as well as the Google Play Store called Light Painting, which you can see already downloaded on my phone here. After it's downloaded, just go ahead and open it up. If you notice at the bottom of the screen, you will see a few settings and on the right side of the shutter button, there is a setting called duration and that's the one that we want to use to change the shutter speed. So we're going to go ahead and click duration. And the number on the left of the slide bar represents the number of seconds that the shutter will stay open while taking the picture. So to make it the same as a camera, we're going to go ahead and slide this until it is 15 right there. Now the duration is set and we can move on to the next step. So once you take the picture, the shutter will remain open for 15 seconds. During that time, light will enter the camera and you want to maintain the same shape or whatever shape that you'll be drawing. So in order to do a circle, I would stand here and create a circle for 15 seconds. If it takes longer, you can always repeat the motion until your shutter closes. If you look at the picture that is inserted on your screen, that is the image we just took. If you notice, part of my circle is out of the frame of the shot. So this is a good time for you to look at your own picture and reevaluate it and see if there are any changes that need to be made. In our case, we could either move the camera a little further back, I could step back and make myself further from the camera. If these two options aren't available, then when you are doing the light painting, you have to remember that you need to make your motions a little bit smaller. For our next example, we're going to be using the smartphone and trying a different shape this time. Let's turn off the lights. Ready? Ready. As you can see, when you use the light painting app, you can actually see the moment by moment picture that you are getting while you are doing the light painting, which might make it easier than using the camera. After you are done taking the picture, if you're happy with the picture, you can go ahead and save the picture using the save option at the top right hand corner. As you continue to improve on your light painting skills, you can move on to some more advanced things, like the pictures that are being shown here. So thank you for joining us today. We hope that you learned something, but more importantly, that you had fun doing it. Even though our time here is dark, continue to explore and experiment. Get creative and make your own life. Hi, I'm Jeff Taylor, retired professor in the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology. And what you see behind me is the lunar sample viewed in the microscope. I've been studying these rocks for a long time. And what I want to do now is to understand how we can use them to help build lunar bases on the moon and eventually on Mars. Aloha. My name is Kumiko Usuda Sato. I am an outreach scientist from National Astronomical Observatory of Japan, NAOJ. I would like to invite you to get on board a virtual cruise ship called Galaxy Cruise to start your galactic journey. At first, let me introduce myself. Now I live in Tokyo, Japan, but until June 2013, my family and I lived in Hilo on the big island of Hawaii. It's me in Hilo, and this is my husband. We are astronomers, and we have two children. 
They were born in Hilo and grew up in Hilo. In Hawaii, I did extensive outreach activities. I visited many, many local classrooms and held science workshops. In Japan, one of my projects is inclusive astronomy. Using a 3D printer, we have developed the tactile super telescope model. Many visually impaired people and sighted people enjoy touching the 3D models of the telescope and also celestial bodies. Did you know NAOJ's or Japanese large telescope called the Super Telescope is on Mauna Kea of the big island of Hawaii? The Super Telescope has a 27 feet diameter primary mirror. It's a big mirror and at the top of the telescope over here, a giant digital camera called Hyperash Prime Cam is mounted. This is the picture of the Hyperash Prime Cam HSC mounted on the Super Telescope. Look, the Hyperash Prime Cam HSC is as big as an adult. HSC has captured many, many galaxies with various shapes. One of the big mysteries of today's astronomy is how galaxies were formed and how galaxies grew up. Look at this picture. Two spiral galaxies are attracting each other through their mutual gravity and changing their shapes. The galaxy interactions and merger events may be the key to unlock the mysteries of galaxies. Why don't you get on galaxy cruise to help astronomers find and classify interacting galaxies this is the top page of Galaxy Cruise website. Before you participate, you need to have the three steps of the training session to get a boarding pass. Please click training. The first step is you need to know the two types of galaxies. The one is round shaped elliptical galaxy and another is disc shaped spiral galaxy. You have five questions. Question number one, look at this picture captured by the Spiral Telescope. Is this galaxy elliptical or spiral? If you click select elliptical, sorry, this is not correct. No, this is a spiral galaxy, click this one. Yay, this is correct. Captain makes a happy face because you can see spiral patterns. This is a spiral galaxy. When you finish answering all five questions, please click, click, go to lesson two. In lesson two, you will learn what is an interacting galaxy is. Look at the shape of the galaxy very carefully. Interacting galaxies are partially pulled out or distorted. You will have another five questions. When you finish answering all five questions, please click go to lesson three. In the last training, lesson three, you will learn the four features of interacting galaxies. Rings, shells or fans or tails or distortion. You will have other five questions. These are a little bit difficult for you, but you can do it. After you finish answering all five questions, please click this button. And yay, congratulations, you got the boarding pass of Galaxy Cruise. And click go to the login screen. This is a login screen of Galaxy Cruise. If you don't have an account, please click here and create, create your account. If you have your account, please log in. This is the welcome page. When you click the ship's wheel, a galaxy is displayed. So uh, and you can change the size using a touchpad or mouse, mouse wheel. The first one, is this elliptical or spiral? Same as the question of lesson one, maybe elliptical. And same as the lesson two, is this galaxy interacting or not interacting? Maybe many faint features interacting. 
And same as lesson three, what kind of feature do you see? Maybe you see some tails and also distortion and click submit. And you repeat this classification. When you click this suitcase icon, you can see your voyage log with the cruise map over here. The cruise map consists of the four small towns and six big continents. When you complete a town or a continent, you will get a passport stamp in your passport. Look, this one. And please click this paperback icon. You will receive some souvenir icons while you are cruising. You can enjoy various shapes of galaxies in the best high quality cosmic images captured by the Svaro Telescope. Let's set sail for the cosmic ocean. We are waiting for your boarding. Mahalo, Nui Loa. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Adria Fung, and I'm currently the middle school robotics teacher and coach at St. Louis School in Honolulu, Hawaii. I'm a graduate of Sacred Hearts Academy and was on the robotics team for four years. I graduated from Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts with a degree in robotics engineering. On July 30th of this year, NASA launched a rover to Mars and is set to land there on February 18, 2021. What is the name of that rover? The name of that rover is Perseverance. Hi, I'm Katie Limigan. I'm an education coordinator at NASA's Johnson Space Center in the Office of STEM Engagement. I'm excited to be here with you today to share this fun lesson. This lesson called On Target comes from our Mars 2020 STEM Toolkit. It shows us a little bit about how NASA lands spacecraft on planets and moons. NASA lands spacecraft in different ways depending upon the goals of the mission. For example, we just launched our NASA's Perseverance Mars rover and it's traveling really fast through space towards a target, Mars. Because the rover is landing by itself, scientists and engineers had to do a lot of work in advance to understand the forces and motions involved to land on target and to program the computer to land in the right spot. For other missions, a spacecraft might drop a probe onto the surface of the planet while the spacecraft continues orbiting from above, like NASA's Artemis program, which will launch astronauts to a moon orbiting gateway, and then those astronauts will fly on a lunar lander to land and explore the moon. For this lesson, you will need the following materials. Nine feet of smooth line, like fishing line, kite string, or dental floss, one index card, one marble, which will act as your lander, one paper clip, one medium-sized paper cup, which will act as your spacecraft, a target, masking tape, and some scissors. Don't worry if you can't find the identical items to this list. If you look at my picture, I had to substitute a binder clip for my marble, a plastic cup for my paper cup, and scotch tape for masking tape. Once you have gathered your materials, you'll then want to construct your target and zip line. Don't forget to make your zip line at a slant. The, the higher the slant, the faster your spacecraft will travel. Hang your spacecraft on the zip line. And now brainstorm ideas how your spacecraft, your cup, will release the lander, your marble, on the target. Will your lander uh, be inside of the cup? Will it sit on the outside? Will you build a platform? How are you going to release your marble in order to land it on the target? Now design your spacecraft. Test your initial design and evaluate your results. Repeat to get consistent accuracy. Redesign your spacecraft and test again. Keep testing until you consistently can get a bullseye. Here are some of the demonstrations that I tried um, earlier in my house. My first trial run, if you notice, my spacecraft moves way too fast and overshoots the target. By my sixth trial run, I had gotten it down, the speed down, and almost really made a bullseye. To view this lesson and others in the Mars 2020 STEM Toolkit, please visit the website on the screen. Don't forget, we're ready to explore moon to Mars and the moon lights the way. Thank you and have a great day. Hi everyone, my name is Devin Chu and I am a postdoctoral researcher at the University of California, Los Angeles in astronomy and astrophysics. I graduated from Hilo High School 
and I became inspired to become an astronomer by working with fellow astronomers in my hometown of Hilo. My research focuses on stars that orbit a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. I wanted to ask you, like, do you know how heavy the supermassive black hole is at the center of our galaxy? Now let's think about it in terms of our sun. Is this supermassive black hole 4,000 times more massive than our sun? 400,000 times more massive than our sun? 4 million times more massive than our sun? Or 4 billion times more massive than our sun? The answer is four million times the mass of our sun. So it's quite heavy. Hope everyone has a great time exploring. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Sane and I am here to talk to you from NASA's Office of STEM Engagement to show you some exciting new resources that we have that you can use in your classrooms or at home as ways to engage in NASA's mission. So first, I'm going to do just a really brief little overview of myself. Um, I, like I said, I'm a NASA Education Coordinator. I'm in the Office of STEM Engagement um, at Johnson Space Center. I work for the In Space Agreement through Oklahoma State University. And I used to be a former um, elementary school teacher in Virginia. So I've definitely um, kind of promoted these materials as if they're things that you can easily use. As a former teacher, these are things that I would have loved um, to use in my classroom. So for NASA's Office of STEM Engagement, um, as this quote says here, we are looking for ways students to can contribute to NASA's mission um, through authentic learning that can help to build a, a diverse future STEM workforce for the nation. Um, we always, you know, create opportunities or products that allow students to see themselves at NASA why NASA is important to them um, while also helping to strengthen their own understanding of STEM um, and how they can make those powerful connections to what we do um, here at NASA. Um, so we have four mission focused activities that we are um, continuing to promote. One of those being commercial crew um, and you're gonna see some uh, resource from that activity here in just a second, um, celebrating the return of human spaceflight to American soil. We also have the Moon to Mars activity, which focuses on NASA's mission um, to go forward to the moon and then on to Mars through the Artemis program. We have the aeronautics activity that's looking at the next generation of aircraft and then STEM on station, which creates resources to bring the International Space Station to your classroom. So each of these activities is working on a variety of things, but one of the things that a couple of them have really focused on recently are STEM kits. So websites that have easy to implement activities for teachers and parents and students to go on and, um, and participate in either at home or in their classrooms. The commercial crew next gen STEM program has the STEM launch kit, which is updated for each commercial crew launch. STEM One Station has the Celebrating Station Science Kit, which kicked off in August, along with a STEM Mission Kit, so you can continue celebrating the mission even after launch. And then Moon to Mars has the Mars 2020 STEM Toolkit as we celebrate um, perseverance on its way to Mars. So one of the things I'm gonna show you today is the crew orbital docking coding simulation that you can access. So let me see if I can share my screen here for you. So you can see where you can access this if you would like to um, do this yourself at home or in a classroom. So you should be seeing right now what we call our STEM launch kit. Um, so this is what's updated. It might look different when you go to look at it, but this is what's updated for each commercial crew launch. Um, and one of the activities that I mentioned we're gonna be looking at really briefly today is the crew orbital docking simulation. So if you click on this activity, um, all you will need is internet access to be able to complete this. It has an educator guide, which you can access here. If you're doing this from home, you can also use this guide. And then it gives you the files that you'll need to download um, to, in order to do, this, to do this coding activity 
on either of the applications that it mentions. So once you click on the educator guide, like I said, you can be an educator, parent, or student to do this. Um, as long as you have internet connection, there's a variety of ways you can complete this activity, um, a variety of different constraints or challenges you can use in this activity. Um, two different um, websites that we recommend to do this, which there's a variety out there, but um, these two use block-based programming um, coding. I'm gonna show you guys through Scratch one of the ways you can do this. So I already have one of the projects pulled up here. And you can see, since we're limited on time, I went ahead and made a, a really simple little code here. Um, but there's a variety of different things you can do in order to make the spacecraft dock to the International Docking Adapter. Um, when you download those initial files, you'll see on there that you can either choose the um, Boeing Starliner or you can choose the SpaceX Crew Dragon um, to dock to the International Docking Adapter. Like I said, there's a variety of different constraints you can use, but you ultimately want to build this to where it's challenging for somebody that it's kind of a game to where they have to go in and be able to dock to the international docking adapter. So the one I have here is a very, very simple code. Um, so you're definitely going to want to do something that's a little more challenging. But as you can see, even here, all I have to do is click the um, flag. I coded it to where when you click the flag, you click the go button, it tells you what you need to do in order to dock to the international docking adapter. Um, so it said to click the space bar. And as you'll see, I also coded it to where when you click the space bar, it docks to the space station. Docking was successful. And it plays a little bit of music and says it's time to do dirt. So that was a really brief activity that you guys are welcome to participate in. Like I said, either from your classrooms or at home, you can be a student or a teacher to really dive into these resources. Um, if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to us. Our contact information is provided and definitely check out our resources, which would be found at nasa.gov backslash STEM. Um, that's where you will find the super search engine that will take you to each of these toolkits. Thank you for joining us today, and I hope that you find some use in these resources I've shared. My name is Matt Sakamoto, and I'm a doctor at Circle Medical in San Francisco. I'm a graduate of Iolani School and Washington University in St. Louis. I was inspired to go into a career in science and medicine through summer programs at Future Flight, Oceanit, and the Hawaii Pacific Health Summer Student Research Program. My question for you today is, what is the best way to reduce the spread of the COVID-19 virus? Is it A, wear a face mask, B, wash your hands regularly, C, avoid indoor gatherings, or D, all of the above? The correct answer is D, all of the above, because washing your hands, wearing a face mask, and avoiding indoor gatherings is a way to help keep us all healthy and safe. Hi, I'm Lacey's sister, Diana. And on behalf of the many facilitators of this new age day of discovery, we wanna thank you for your adventuresome spirit in participating today. The whole world has changed in how we participate with each other as witnessed by this virtual program. And I know Lacey would have been so excited and up to the challenge of presenting everything that you've learned, heard, and shared today. You see, Lacey did not comprehend the word no, especially when it came to something he envisioned that he wanted to accomplish. If there were clouds in his view, he could still see the stars through them. His time may have run out on our planet Earth, but not his spirit. So keep him near in your personal voyages, through your pathways in learning, your adventures, your accomplishments, and I know you'll be able to hear him saying, wow, thanks a lot. That's really great. Aloha and mahalo. Hi, my name is Nolan Kamitaki, and I am a human geneticist at Harvard Medical School. I'm a graduate of Waikia High School in Hilo, Hawaii, and Harvard University in Cambridge, Massachusetts. I was inspired to go into science from doing Hawaii Science Fair, and uh, 
Today, I study the genetic associations to psychiatric diseases. A uh, question I have for you is, if you stretched out the human genome uh, found in one, each one of our cells, how long would it be? Would it be a centimeter, a meter, two meters, even 10 meters? The answer is actually two meters, and you can calculate this because each base pair is about 340 picometers long, and there are roughly 3.1 billion of these in each of our genomes, one copy from, uh, from our dad and one copy from our mother. Aloha from Houston, Texas and NASA's Johnson Space Center. I'm Stan Love, space shuttle astronaut and a proud former resident of the 808 state. A couple of years ago, I was thrilled to spend several weeks on Kilauea Volcano, one of my favorite places on Earth, with a project that simulated geological exploration on Mars. Right now, NASA's Artemis program is working to land the first woman and the next man on the moon by 2024. And it's about time, since our last human moon mission was Apollo 17 in 1972. With Artemis, we want to develop a permanent presence on the moon, which will help us get ready for eventual human missions to Mars. As we prepare for these incredible voyages, we'll need more of you to join us at NASA as scientists or engineers or in any one of thousands of other really cool jobs. And who better to do those jobs than people from Hawaii, a land originally settled by people who crossed thousands of miles of open ocean in canoes, navigating without instruments, probably the nearest thing in human history to reaching another planet. Mahalo nui loa for joining us. Have a great school year and stay safe. I hope to see you working at NASA someday. Wow, what a day. Thank you so much for joining us for our first virtual beach day of discovery. Mahalo to the participants, the special guests, our volunteers, and the organizations that hosted today's workshops and ads. A big mahalo again to Art and Reen Kamara for being the dynamic duo and keeping the spark of flying in space alive in all of us. A few reminders before we sign off. Submit your galaxy treasure hunt answers. Make sure to complete all 10 questions. And we hope to see you at the live virtual field trips to be held in November and December. For K through eighth graders, Remember to register and receive the Hardware Science Tumblr Kit. Check out the links below for information on both. It has been an honor and a privilege to be your MC for today's event. and hope that you've been inspired to learn more about NASA, about the explorers who literally broke the sound barrier and paved the way for SpaceX and the upcoming NASA Artemis missions. Stay safe in these COVID times Mahalo and aloha. Mahuiho mako until we meet again.